Board seven. Present Stephen Brown. Mary Board eight. <laughs> Mary Board uh, nine will not make it. Uh, Mary Board 10 also is not making it. Mary Board 11. Um, present, no so wrong. Mary Board 12 indicated that they would not be. All right. Um, do I have a motion for the adoption of the July 15, 2021 agenda? So moved. So I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Any amendments? Anyone abstaining? Abstain. We have four land use matters that we're voting on today. Um, we are going to do the presentations. And after each presentation, if there's a member from the public, I do have two for one particular issue. We will call for members of the public to testify. And then um, we will probably move on to chair reports. And, and whenever 10 o'clock hits, the council members should be here and then we'll go to a vote and we'll vote on each of the four matters. Um, so to start, we, we have um, a presentation on the special permit by Boston Properties and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority for 341-347 Madison Avenue. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Borough Board members. I'm Zach Bernstein with Free Frank Land Use Council of the Boston Properties. This is a joint application of Boston Properties and the MCA for the redevelopment of 343 Madison Avenue, the former MCA's exporter site, into a new office building with an on site entrance to the new east side access station. Here with me. Is Bob Kelly and Jeremy Parnes of the MCA, Rich Monopoly of Boston Properties, and Andrew Cleary of KPI Architects. Next slide, please. On the left of the screen is a map of the um, Special Midtown District and in uh, the East Midtown Subdistrict. In orange rectangle is the Vanderbilt Corridor, which is a subdistrict that was enacted before the larger East Midtown District. And the orange rectangle is the Site 343 Madison Avenue. This is an application for special permits under a public realm improvement bonus to increase the FAR from 15 to 30 through provision of on site and off site transit improvements, together with certain waivers to facilitate the larger building. Next slide, please. Bob will now discuss the project's importance for the MTA. Great, thank you, Zach. Uh, I'm Bob Haley, Senior Director of Transit and Development at the MTA. As you know, this project's been a long time in coming. We moved out of the our former headquarters building to, to Broadway in 2015 and issued an RFP for redevelopment and selected Boston Properties as the redevelopment company uh, and, and we'll enter into a ground lease, um, which will generate full taxes and also uh, rental revenues over a 99 year period. And as contemplated in the RFP, uh, these payments will provide critical uh, revenues to support MTA's capital program. Next slide, please. Um, the project will provide both on-site and off-site <laughs> improvements, which are shown here. Uh, and it's off the page, but um, that's actually not the uh, slide. But, um, <laughs> It, and uh, there'll be an on-site improvement, which is direct access to the Long Island Railroad east side access project, and then all three um, off-site improvements in the 42nd Street subway station and the Flushing Line. Uh, Jeremy Parnes from New York City Transit will describe the three off-site improvements for you. Thank you, Bob. My name is Jeremy Parnes. I am the director of the station planning group within operations planning at New York City Transit, and I'll talk to you about the off-site subway improvements. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the offsite subway improvements uh, revolve around three improvements uh, along the flushing platform of Grand Central Station. Grand Central Station is the second busiest station in the system. I think uh, a lot of people will agree that um, it is very busy. Uh, there are a lot of congestion points and uh, there, are, there are a lot of needs to improve uh, capacity for passenger circulation throughout the station. So uh, what we have here again is the flushing platform. North is looking up to the west uh, is, uh, sorry, to the left is to the west and that's around Park Avenue. And to the right is the east. Uh, that uh, core over there that says number three is the uh, third avenue end of the station. Um, and basically, these offsite improvements are really meant to enhance uh, passenger circulation uh, uh, for the flushing platform and for some of its connections. So, if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about uh, each set of the improvements real quick. So, the first set, and this is on the west side uh, of the station. Uh, this is the corridor and passageway that uh, it connects off of the platform itself of the flushing line to seven, uh, and it brings you to a corridor and then uh, a set of stairs under the uh, Lexington Avenue four, five, six platforms. And the two staircases, it gets cut off a little bit, but thank you. On the bottom, on the bottom page, those two staircases highlighted in, in yellow are uh, transfer stairs to the uptown four, five, six. And basically, we will be expanding those stairs to go from two passenger lanes to three passenger lanes, uh, and this will substantially improve passenger flow, and actually it will help uh, improve train operations at platform level for the uh, four, five, six. Uh, and um, we're basically uh, going from two to three passenger lanes per stair, so we have a nice capacity for the stair. If we go to the next slide, we're now somewhat in the middle of the platform. And uh, actually, if you just scroll up a little bit more, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. What we have here is what we call the center core. Uh, the yellow, again, is what we're going to add from this project. It's two additional platform stairs, kind of towards the middle, again, of the flushing line platform. And these will provide a real critical means of access to uh, or exit off of the platform. It will help spread the load on the platform for exiting and will help relieve some of the congestion at the existing platform stairs that are shown just to the left of the yellow. Uh, it will connect into the existing passageway that then brings you either through escalators up to the uh, mezzanine or uh, connects to the underside of the four, five, six platforms. Uh, and then the next slide, as we go further east along the platform, uh, this is the third set of improvements and we're widening that end of platform stair from its existing four passenger lanes, about 10 feet wide to uh, about 15 feet wide, uh, six passenger lanes, so a nice 50% increase in capacity. This again will help reduce existing congestion and that will benefit both the individual customers as their delays uh, to get out will be decreased and also help hopefully improve train operations. Uh, and it will also just, we, we, we if possible, we don't like to have congestion on the platform and, and it will help in that sense. So all these taken together are, are meant to improve the rider experience using the station and to uh, just help with customer flow and reduce congestion. And lastly, uh, yep. uh, basically these three uh, uh, circulation improvements will really substantially improve uh, uh, levels of service for the circulation elements and uh, really help address uh, a lot of longstanding circulation issues at this station. Uh, I think that's it for the offsite. Improvements. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. So I'm going to describe for you the, uh, the onsite improvements in the next slide. Um, this, this plan that you should see in front of you is the existing <laughs> pedestrian circulation that, <laughs> that serves Metro North. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the blue in this slide shows the very deep platforms and concourse level of the Long Island Railroad East Side Access, um, which will open next year, uh, 160 feet below the street level. And most of the exiting from East Side Access um, will be through the existing street exits. Um, but the opportunity to redevelop 343 Madison is the first an opportunity for a direct connection from street down to a mezzanine level. Uh, 
So uh, the that, as you can see here, the, the the light blue is the are the platforms, and the yellow site area shows where the, it, the strategic location of this exit from the southernmost uh, platform level will be provided. If you go to the next slide, we have. Uh, is it a better yeah. image there? Oh yeah. yes. That's right. Right. Yeah. I know there's a lot on the screen here. So, yeah, the um, light blue is the platform and track level for east side access that the really thought was pretty good, 160 feet down. The concourse to the west is in a darker blue, which is about 50 feet below grade. And he was noting that most of the, the entrances uh, when this opens will be through the existing <coughs> yellow Metro North network where you go in some of the existing entrances you may be familiar with, get down to Metro North and then go down again. This illustrates in the darkest blue, the straight shot that this site gives from Madison Avenue level down to the concourse, which I think uh, Rich will speak about a bit further. Yeah, so I think that, that concludes the uh, description of the onsite improvements. So I'll turn it over to Rich. Now. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, my name is Rich Monopoly. I'm a Senior Vice President of Development for Boston Properties. Um, here, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, in more detail, the entrance from Madison Avenue down to the new Madison Avenue concourse shown in light blue. Our proposed onsite improvement is in dark blue. The Madison Avenue concourse is in light blue and the Metro North platforms are in yellow above the new concourse. Next slide. The construction of this set of improvements is a significant undertaking. It involves excavation through bedrock to five stories below grade to tie into the existing concourse level. Following excavation, we'll install and maintain the following station improvements. Three escalators, 40 inch wide escalators, from street level 50 feet below down to the station, a new stairway alongside those escalators, and an ADA elevator between street level and the concourse level. Next slide. On the left here, we show some images of the new LIRR Madison concourse level, scheduled to open December 22. And on the right hand side, we show our Madison Avenue entrance, the on site improvement in the bottom right here shown to stand out prominently on Madison Avenue and be kind of a beacon for that entrance down into the concourse level. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew Cleary to talk a little bit more about the building. Hi, I'm Andrew Cleary. I'm a principal at KPS, one of the architects um, who's been working on this for the last couple of years. Uh, it does not move a slide. It can only point. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think you I turned it off after that. Okay. Yeah. We'll you just turn it back on. There okay. we go. Okay. There we go. There we go. <laughs> we can start talking about the building. Okay. Uh, I've always thought for this building that the majority of the complexity is below grade. So when you get up to grade, it gets a little easier. Uh, however, it's still a very constrained site at 25,000 square feet. So that's a tight site for, for the amount of FAR that we're building on this site. And it's already constrained. Uh, it's further constrained by the bed building that you see here that has been built. Um, and has been there for a couple of years. And that's the exhaust belt spent for all of the east side access uh, infrastructure down below grade. So what that leaves is we can only move the east side access entrance that Rich just described to the north of the site. Uh, and then uh, given that we want to generate- uh, You're standing sorry. immediately in front of me. So you. you can't actually <laughs> see it over here. Uh, once you try to kind of- Over here? Yes. Exactly. Or the room is over there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. So then when you try to kind of massage commercially viable floor plates into the tower, that pushes the core to the east side of the site. Uh, what that does is it allows us to create a, an entrance lobby on Madison Avenue. You pull the, the side, the face of the building back a full seven feet to enlarge the sidewalk to 20 feet on Madison Avenue. The existing sidewalk is only 10 feet to the north on 45th Street, so we've added an extra five feet to gain 15 feet. And uh, on the south side, we already have 15 feet. So next slide, please. You can start to see how that fills itself out architecturally here on a ground floor plan. Uh, the, again, the east side access uh, 
entrance that Rich described is on the north, three escalators and stairs downstairs. The loading dock is down to the south. It can only go on 44th since uh, curb cuts aren't allowed on Madison or 45th Street, which is Truth Street. Uh, once we start to fill out the, the core and the elevators primarily, they're pushed to the east, which creates a gracious lobby on Madison Avenue with retail components, both on the southwest corner and up on the uh, northeast corner of the site. Right? Trying to make a, trying to kind of follow through after those uh, spatial layouts, uh, the architecture. Uh, starts as a podium and a tower on top of it. You can see here on the left, and then we start to sculpt and craft the shapes. We pull back, uh, or we kind of reveal the northwest corner of the podium to kind of break down the massing and also to celebrate the east side access entrance at the bottom. You can see we bring the tower down to just above the entrance, which celebrates and articulates the, uh, the entrance down to the low grade. Then the third slide starts to show how we uh, step back the building as it rises to, to compose the, the composition of the building as the elevator uh, banks drop off as the building rises. And lastly, the, the last slide will start to will show one of the renderings that we've developed uh, over the course of the project. We, we're very proud of it. It's taken a lot of time to get it to this point, uh, but we feel that the scale and character and identity that it adds to East Midtown is uh, is quite appropriate and very handsome. That concludes the presentation. I'm going to take questions. Questions? Okay. questions? Two questions. Jeffrey always has good questions. <clears throat> Thank you for this. It's exciting to know that Eastside Access will be opening in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> the uh, bike parking and um, carting is, I saw a loading dock. Does that plan for all the carting to take place inside the building for the tenants? Rich, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, and Andrew can speak to that. We, we, my code, we're designing bike parking to be kind of in the basement of the building. Uh, we haven't decided yet if it's valet or self service, but the entrance to that will come off the north side on 45th. We have a dedicated entrance for our cyclists, by the way, which we're seeing more and more of in our portfolio in New York. And then in terms of carting, all those would be enclosed inside the loading dock. Loading dock comes off the of 44th, as you know, 45th is Screw Street, so it has to come off 44th. So that would reside inside that dock on 44th. Thank you. Exactly what I was going to say. Thank you. Tammy, could you give a little uh, explanation what kind of green initiatives are included within the, the building? Will there be any opportunities for distribution centers within all the multi new layers below to help get trucks off the street? Will there be any uh, recycling and composting within the building? To what level will it handle just the building or will it offer community amenities to those around? So right now, uh, what we're targeting on the sustainability side, by the way, we take sustainability very seriously. Uh, as a public company with 52 million square feet across five major markets, it's something we're heavily focused on. This building would target a legal rating. And as you know, the envelope uh, restrictions and requirements for the building code here in New York have gotten much more liberal. So the combination of those two things, plus we would pursue a thick well certification, which is more about the inhabitants and the inhabitants' health. We have a combination of building sustainability plus the inhabitants' health, which puts together, I think, a very good package. In terms of specific systems, right now we're going to, uh, we're targeting what's called a DOAS system, which brings 100% fresh outdoor air to specific zones on the floor, and that is much more, uh, call it, uh, pandemic viral friendly than your traditional of your traditional DAV system that uses a return plenum and mixes all the air back into a, a central location. So fresh air delivered locally to each user, I think is going to help us uh, become more of a pandemic ready product. Okay, so that's one of the interior systems. In terms of what's your your oh, other question about the distribution, distribution centers, if you're <clears throat> Composting, recycling, is it for the building itself? Will there be any public amenity for centers of those types within? So we do have uh, a pretty uh, structured recycling program uh, in our existing portfolio that we would come forward to here. We use green cleaning practices on top of that. And we're also pursuing green leases with our tenants, encouraging our tenants to dry their energy use down into, uh, in terms of their lighting loads, et cetera. So that's all part of our program and what we do with our existing portfolio. 
In terms of distribution and uh, public access, no, we don't. We have, as Andrew pointed out, we have a very, very constrained site. And with all these other elements, including the MTA event building and this access point down into the concourse, we don't have much room to work with down in the basement. This is a little bit different than one band, which is a full acre site. Uh, so we're a little bit constrained on space. And right now the public access points are in those retail areas at the ground plane, but we don't have, uh, uh, generally speaking, public access through the tower. Okay. Awesome. Can you uh, just show us where the elevator access is? Can we go back two slides? One more? So that's uh, the elevator that's taking from grade down to the side axis. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? I'm always asking about the arts. You know, I heard this, you heard this before. Any chain thoughts that you were thinking about it? In other words, we all want to have some aspect of, at least I want. Every building in New York built needs to have something for the arts, free space, something. So know, I, let me take a shot. At that I mean, I know you want to put, you know, something public art. I got it, but something that people could use that would be performance or visual or artists in residence. Free, F R E E. Yes. So um, <laughs> when we met with you yes. five years ago at Six Hundred One Wax, you yes. indicated you made that same indication. I know. The pandemic has has tra you know, been troubling. We want to, we're desperate to open that public space again. And that has some of the art elements that you were asking. You say the public space, is it an outdoor space or an indoor? No, I'm talking about 601 Lex, the bottom of the city group center, the enclosed atrium. It's that's the indoor space. And yeah. we filled that with art projects that we'd like to show you. In any case, we'd like to do the same here. We're just limited on space. So I think that's that limited. That's true. But as it pertains to the NCA entrance, I think we can collaborate with you all to provide a very highly visible wall. If you scroll back to the rendering on, of that corner, <clears throat> a really highly visible location for potential for this. So rendering, can you go back up a little bit? We'll slide that in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Say two. Right here. Right here. Okay. One down. Yeah. One. Or this one. This is better. You can show here. And you can point out the location that we can accommodate. About this wall. If you, if you remember what we did no, at Vanderbilt that. and the transit halls, we yeah. have the, the wall that's just. So that would be a fabulous mural or something yeah. that was appropriate for the space. And I'm always looking for working artists yeah. to have a space that they could. It's a very hard to come by in the borough of Manhattan. And I think it's a draw. So you may be some place that you could think about that working artist, the Shoshama type of uh, opportunity. I don't know if you know Shoshama. It's uh, Andrew, uh, Anita Dirk. I think you've heard of her father. And she goes all over the city putting in <laughs> opportunities for artists to work. Yeah, and underutilized retail spaces yes. around, uh, you know, real estate. It's my favorite program. So I'm just saying, if you could think of something, the wall sounds great, and that's important yeah. for people yeah. to see art, and even changing art, if you could do something. The rotating program. Yes, but I would like you to just think about that, even though it's, you know, doesn't make your bottom line, having artists is a draw. Understood. So keep thinking about it. I might echo the borough president's note only because there are, other than the zoning for accessibility, there is no sustainability or other public ask, public benefit. It, this is a great public benefit, don't get me wrong, but it's a very targeted one that's related to the zoning. So um, even the art benefit for public would be uh, something that's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, um, thank, you very much. Um, thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next presentation, but just um, to state on this matter, only community boards five and six will be voting on it, along with council members. Is there anyone from the public who's shown up to speak on Madison Avenue? No? Seeing none. Okay, uh, Department of City Planning. In here? Yes. Right here. Right there. Um, Department of City Planning will be making three presentations. We'll stop at the end of each for any questions. And the first will be on 
um, health and fitness. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Barry Dinerstein. I'm the planner with the Department of State Planning. Um, we have three fairly complicated zoning text amendments. Um, many of you have sort of seen these um, before, so I want to go reasonably quickly and then have a lot of time for questions if people have questions. Um, we sort of explain. Um, so uh, the purpose of the first one we're going to talk about is the health and fitness text amendment. Um, and this is a, a text amendment to reduce red tape, red tape for small businesses that provide health-related amenities to community. Um, health and fitness uh, impacts is impacted by the proposed proposal with a range of activities that are we're all familiar with, uh, large commercial gyms, including chains like Blink or Planet Fitness, smaller independent gyms, studios such as martial arts, yoga or aerobics, therapeutic and wellness businesses such as spas and licensed massage therapy. Okay, currently there is a BSA special permit to open these businesses anywhere in New York City. Permit was created in the 1970s to address commercial sex that was uh, concentrated around Times Square. Since then, there have been some very significant changes. We've seen dramatic growth in the health and fitness industry and the desire of communities to have access to these amenities. There's also been a change in the regulation of massage therapy, which is now a health profession licensed by the New York State uh, Department of Education. Next slide. Um, these businesses continue to be regulated through zoning, placing a significant business on small businesses. The special permit takes more than six months to be granted and can cost anywhere from thirty dollars to $50,000. In addition, the special permit is not applicable in C1 districts that are widely mapped throughout the city meaning that gym, spas, and massage therapy is not allowed in locations where we allow most other retail uh, commercial uses. And finally, at a point when vacancy is very high along retail streets, we want to ensure that zoning regulations allow business to occupy the stores. Next slide. So what we are proposing is to remove the BSA special permit for all gyms, spas, and licensed massage therapy. Uh, referred to in this city zoning resolution as physical culture and health establishments. Gyms and spas would be considered commercial uses and they would be allowed as a right. Smaller gyms, those that are less than 10,000 square feet, would be allowed in the most, most broadly of, of all commercial and manufacturing districts, while larger gyms would be, would be slightly more limited to the higher density commercial districts uh, as well as C and M districts. Next slide. Licensed massage therapy will be treated the same as other outpatient medical uses in zoning. They will be characterized as either ambulatory healthcare or healthcare offices. Uh, it is illegal to practice massage without a license. An unlicensed massage will continue not to be allowed anywhere in New York City, um, and the proposed zoning will not change that. And the text amendment was referred out to the community board for board of presidents on May 19th. And the uh, um, uh, deadline is July 27 for responses on the action. Um, any questions? Tammy. So we have some concerns in community board one. We looked at it. Uh, our resolution is in draft form. We'll vote today. But we have, maybe it's particular to our neighborhood. I'm not 100% sure. But there are establishments that have outdoor space and the noise and the sound. And one of the conversations that comes obviously with community board review is about hours in the open space, um, whether it be roof deck, backyard, or any of the like. There's nothing in this um, that actually takes into any kind of outdoor space issues. And we're requesting that the CB receive copies of the sound attenuation plan that the applicants are required to submit to DOB before a CFO is issued and asking that there be a layer in there that the CB have a chance to invite the applicant and issue a recommendation before a CFO is issued. Um, uh, two comments is, is one, um, you know, we welcome your comments about having a chance to look at the uh, um, noise attenuation plans. Um, in terms of the outdoor uh, uses, Certain high activity outdoor uses are limited in terms of what can and can't be done. Um, but I think um, we can look a little bit more and tighten that up in terms of what people can and can't do. Uh, that is good. We're still asking. 
for detail for CV oversight for quality of life considerations because we want to be included in the beginning to try and avoid having to talk about it later. Mm -hmm. um, and the other comment, obviously, is we are still in a historic district with lots of thin walls between buildings for the historic neighborhood. So for us, it's you know we're not worried about one of the brand new buildings that's built soundproof. We're worried more in the older sections. Okay. Uh, again, those comments are helpful, and um, I think they'll help the commission uh, make an informed decision on, on the. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, committee board to um, approve this, but with conditions, and a couple of things are similar to Tammy's, but one is some kind of a verification, a professional certification by an acoustical engineer, not self-certified. Again, because of the old in buildings and some kind of hour restriction when there's a PCE in a residential or mixed use building. Um, so, you know, there's not a Zumba class going on at 10 o'clock at night or six in the morning and, and you can um, imagine where, and then it, in, and some kind of DEP response or enforcement mechanism, because you know, the, like we're gonna, if there is a problem, we're gonna hear about it at the community board level and we'd rather come up with some parameters ahead of time so we don't create, have these problems come up. Again, I think these comments are helpful um, and they are definitely things that we've been concerned about and it will help us in terms of formulating the final proposal. So thank you and you know, whatever else you want to add that you think is helpful, please let us know. Well, go ahead. I said a small correction on the resolution we're gonna run this uh, next week in July. Any other questions, statements? Thanks, Rosie. Um, Community Board 4, we approved with conditions. A key factor is definitions around the type of, um, I guess, sort of workout offered, I think is really important because as my colleagues mentioned, different types of facilities offer different types of workouts. Some of them create noise, some of them don't. And I think really understanding what is setting up shop is a really important thing. So figuring out a better way to define what's happening inside that space would be really useful. And I think that would fall under whether it's DOB, um, but I think it comes out of what DCP will be putting together in this in this uh, zoning text. Okay, great. And again, if you have suggestions or different types of activity that you think are particularly troubling that we've missed, please let us know because we, you know, we're, we're all learning together on this. Guy, have you have you analyzed or at DCP the three on one calls that have come in on these types of establishments over the last I don't know year or something? Is that something that you've looked at? Yeah, we have. Um, and actually, they, they're not they're not a lot. They're not you know, which surprised us. So we're not, not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> That's interesting to know. Yeah. Go ahead. I just have a correction as well for ours, and uh, ours should say that we have not yet adopted a resolution on the application. But I've drafted a resolution to approve this application on the language committee. I think I sent it to you last week. Next. Okay, next one. Are there any members of the public who are going to testify on this matter? Um, well, before we vote on this, I would wonder if some more of our feedback could be included in the resolution. That's friendly. Sorry, we'll, we'll be making edits to the resolution um, right before we vote on them. So at that point, we can we can make all the edits. Hi. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> she popped up and be my slides. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. I just didn't want to. I wanted to make sure that I said that for the record because, as listed, it does not reflect all concerns. It's been flagged, Calusa. Thank you. Pun intended. Anyone else? <laughs> flagged. That's good. Okay, good one. Um, everyone. All the community boards will be voting on this uh, resolution. Okay, we're going to move on to the presentation on fresh. Okay, so the next one uh, we're going to talk about is the fresh program. And uh, in Manhattan, in terms of the zoning, which is what is before the bar board, um, it only applies in community boards nine through 12. Uh, and does not apply to the downtown boards, although there is a tax incentive program which can apply uh, to properties south of board 9 and 9 through 12. Um, 
Next slide. So just so um, uh, people know what this is, is Fresh is a program that was created in 2009 by Adoption City Council that provides incentives for um, including supermarkets in your development projects. Um, and the, there are a number of different benefits. Um, one is, is that you get additional floor area uh, with at one foot of supermarket for one foot of additional residential floor area up to a maximum of 20,000 square feet. In M1 districts, you can do a supermarket up, up to 30,000 square feet of floor area, where normally it's 10,000 square feet of floor area, subject to a city planning chair authorization. And also there is an ability to raise the height if there's a height limit in the district from uh, up to 15 feet or one story. Um, and the program applies in basically the South Bronx, uh, Upper Manhattan, Central Brooklyn, and in Jamaica, uh, and a small piece in Hallett Point in Queens. Next slide. Um, to date, uh, since 2009, um, there have been 27 zoning approved projects for fresh. Um, um, uh, five in Manhattan, four in Bronx, 17 in Brooklyn, um, and one in Queens. Um, at present, about eight are operating. A lot of the projects are under construction. Next slide. Um, and the way we determine where fresh would apply is we did a, a study in 2008 called Going to Market, where we looked at a number of different factors uh, in terms of what were happening in different communities, uh, how many supermarkets they had, how much diet related disease there was, how, how um, many supermarkets that were within walking distance of particular communities. And based on that, we created something called the Supermarket Needs in Index, uh, which um, uh, basically documented that in the poorest neighbors of the city, um, there was a, a dearth of supermarkets. Um, and, and we updated that study in 2018 um, and to look at um, and include, uh, including more areas around the city. And we are proposing to uh, enlarge the program um, but not in Manhattan. Next slide. And you know, a basic city policy um, uh, is, is that all New Yorkers deserve to be within comfortable distance of a food store where they can get fresh product uh, and have a choice about where to shop and having choices, you know, results in um, uh, competition in terms of price and also just variety in terms of what uh, you know, people want in terms of what they want to buy and enhances people's quality of life. Uh, next slide. Um, so what we're proposing in terms of the zoning is a, a couple of things. One is expansion of the French the fresh boundaries. Uh, that is obviously not in Manhattan, but there are some things that do affect the uh, Manhattan. Uh, and one of which is basically we're creating a concentration a provision. Um, as I said before, there are about 27 uh, approved fresh programs. Um, about 17 of them are in or near Brooklyn Community Board 3, which is Bed-Stuy. Um, and we have situations where we have a number of fresh projects within a few blocks of one another. And we're concerned, well, we, we want every community to be well served and we want competition. We are concerned that um, you'll get to the point where there'll be just too many stores and the stores won't be able to function. Uh, and then we'll just have vacant storefronts. So in order to deal with that, um, we are prefers, uh, proposing uh, a, a provision that limits con concentration of uh, supermarkets. Uh, we're also, um, um, have an issue where we require um, storefront windows in supermarkets, which is fine if you're building a new building, but if you have an existing building, um, we don't expect you to like tear down walls or put in glass. And so the way the, the existing zoning text is written, it says you must have glass and that has created problems for people who drink the version of the building. So 
uh, consistent with other provisions we have for. That must have been Amanda for her credits. Uh, it was an Amanda. I know. Uh, she and I are hundred percent, one thousand percent in agreement. She, she wanted. She wanted glass. Uh, we gave her glass, but then it created problems for existing don't know buildings. How to do the glass. Don't get me <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's some minor clarifications uh, in the text. Next. Next slide. Okay. So, um, in terms of expansion, uh, just for information, we're proposing. You can see on the map, uh, community districts uh, eight and nine in the Bronx, uh, in Queens one, three, four, and fourteen. Um, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, for into board one, board two, into board 12 and 13, and now for the first time in Staten Island, on the North Shore of Staten Island. Next slide. So to come back to uh, this concern about the saturation or concentration of supermarkets, um, what we're proposing is that within a half mile of any fresh project, so what Fresh does is it gives you, as I said, one foot of supermarket space, um, gets you one foot of residential space, uh, up to a maximum of 20,000 square feet per um, a, a development. And so what we're saying is within a half mile, the maximum amount of additional authority we will grant is 40,000 square feet. So anybody who's applying for a, a Fresh uh, certification, would have to come to city planning and show us that there's not um, more than 40,000 square feet granted within a half mile. At present, that's only an issue in, in the bed slide community. We think it is possible it could be an issue in Harlem. Um, it isn't quite yet, but it could be. Uh, the program has been used in a number of locations in Harlem. So we just don't want to oversaturate. People can open a supermarket, but they won't be able to take advantage of the fresh program if there's already been up to 40,000 square feet of additional residential floor granted within half mile of their location. And the supermarket is still not those awful Dwayne Reeves or CDS. <laughs> oh. I'm always afraid they're going to qualify at some point. Amanda said they wouldn't, but I wouldn't. Right. So, so uh, one of the things- I never buy in those stores. OK, well, one of the things we did, uh, and this was a you know, major concern, was we wrote uh, a definition of a supermarket, uh, which basically- I don't write this because I was so upset. Boy. Yeah, which basically <laughs> says, you know, Dwayne Reed's not doing as well as they once were, but, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but one of the things we basically said is supermarket is a store whose primary purpose is for selling food for home consumption. So yes, Dwayne Reed sells potato chips and they sell Coke and you can buy banana there, but um, but you walk it, you eat it while you're walking. From, yeah, but you know, sort of work. <laughs> I, I don't think it's fair to say that the purpose, the basic purpose of Dwayne Reed is to sell you food for home consumption. Now, if Dwayne Reed wants to change its model and become a supermarket, fine. you know, it's fine, but that's not the okay. same is true of Target, it's the same is true of stores like Dollar General. Um, we don't believe, at least in their present. Operation in terms of what they sell, they qualify. So you can still have a fresh near Dwayne Reed. That's what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. You can still have a fresh near a Dwayne Reed, but it wouldn't be that concentration. Correct. Either. Dwayne Reed would I'm not. I'm trying to make that point. Okay. Next slide. Um, so as I as I said, we are talking about uh, changes to the window requirements, the glazing requirements. Again, that relates to people who are doing conversion of a building. To a fresh store and not to people building a new building. Um, we are updating parking requirements. Um, this is here is mostly an issue uh, on Staten Island and. Um, we don't have, don't have any parking. It does, yeah, it does not affect Manhattan. Um, uh, the other thing we are uh, doing, which uh, could be an issue in Manhattan, is, is we, in order to be considered a fresh supermarket, we have to be at least 6,000 square feet. Um, and we have had examples of people doing multiple stories, uh, which uh, to meet, meet that 6,000 square feet threshold. Um, and that's concerning because when you get a very small store and you have them on multiple stories, we're very concerned that, you know, it's not how a supermarket works. You can't easily move between floors. Um, you know, we're not, 
going to stop people from trying to do that if they want to do it, but they won't be able to participate in the fresh program unless they have 6,000 square feet contiguous on one floor. That's a, that's a change. Can I ask a strange question? Mm -hmm. Does that apply to something like an Italy, which has a market component? It's sort of the in-between the Dwayne Reed and the supermarket, where it has a market component, but it has indoor dining and it has indoor cafes and it's... So I, I guess the question would be is, you know, we've never come up with a question like that, but the question would be, <laughs> is it primarily um, uh, a, a store that sells food for home consumption? It is a portion of what they do. I don't... I Primarily, don't, so... Well, I mean, honestly, if I was the developer, I would make that argument that it's a yes because they sell enough food to go and they have, you know, their pasta section, their meat section, their cheese section. So an argument so, could be made. I, so what we, what, what we, I think my question is primarily, does that? So, so what we would, what, what happens is, is that first of all, we need to see sort of a site plan of how things are laid out. There are requirements in terms of sale of fresh product, mm -hmm. um, perishable product. Um, and they have to show us that on a um, uh, site plan. So we can really sort of look at it. Uh, and then, um, the other issue is, is that every fresh project before it's certified gets sent to the community board. So the community board, so we can look at it and we can sort of say, yeah, we think it complies, we would send it to the community board. The community board would look at it and they give way in on whether they think it complies and whether it's meeting it or not. And um, you know, if there was a disagreement, if they felt that, well, this is really more a restaurant, um, I think we would try and resolve that and say, well, you've got too much space here for you know people to sit there. So all I'm going to say is please understand my skepticism is not in, meant in negatively, but we've seen through community board one, the change in a definition of what is considered many different things like a market that is supposed to be like a green market with from all over New York City co-opted and allowed by city to be a sole vendor providing a market based on different their own so i guess where i'm going is you could conceivably say that but maybe taking a look at the parameters and where the weight of the perspective is on what is considered primarily because the definitions do morph with Right, and, and the stores change over time in terms of how they you know, may address the market. I, I will say that, you know, we are talking about um, basically residential neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are lower income. Um, generally speaking, these are not places where people are trying to do upscale restaurants and, uh, and the like, uh, which is not to say that people could not try that over time. But as of yet, you know, we've, we've processed um, you know, 27 applications, we've had a lot more. The issue of people coming in with some type of um, use that we don't call a supermarket generally doesn't come up. It's not an issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, does, does the developer have to have a signed agreement with a grocery store? to present this plan to city planning because numerous projects in the Clinton urban, urban renewal over area over the past decade, we were promised a grocery store in the lead up to the development. And then sure enough, come time for shovel in, the grocery store pulls out. Um, and then that happened on 53rd Street at a Clinton urban renewal site. And then down 11th Avenue um, in the 40s Gotham West project, the community was told it would be a grocery store and it turned into sort of what Tammy was referring to, um, a high-end market. Uh, you know, not where you go to shop, but where you go and grab a burger or noodles or something and, and not really a, a grocery store at all. So what requirements are in place for the so, developer to have for an so operating So they are at, at application, they are required to have an agreement, a lease from a supermarket operator, which the zoning text says is, um, acceptable to the chair of the city planning commission. Um, 
as you said, there, there part of the problem is, is that between the time they apply and the time they actually build the building and get it ready to occupy the occupant for the store to occupy the space, um, there can be like a long um, uh, period of years and people drop out, people change plans. Um, and so we are trying to sharpen how um, much scrutiny we put into what people are telling us that this, not always, but has proven sometimes to be an issue. And we are concerned and we are aware of it. That, you know, we can't really require a lease because it's so many years out that it, you know, no one is going to sign a lease, but we want to make sure that they really get a real operator. Yeah, and I guess it's a little troubling because grocery operators look at the market very differently than the residential developer or commercial developer would look at the space. And we've seen that happen repeatedly now where we go through a zoning tax amendment or whatever, or the site is going to get dedicated for this. And then when it comes shovel in the ground time, mm -hmm. the grocery operator pulls out. Right. Um, so just another comment, I, the high need areas in Manhattan, Board 3, my colleague, did, I, there was some significant high need there. And it seems to be excluded from the proposal overall. And then a, a moderate need area in Hell's Kitchen is, is really left out. Why are such big swaths of Manhattan left well, out of the proposal. We, we did have discussions about um, community board three and actually community board seven um, regarding whether, not clear that we would have done exactly the fresh program uh, with the various council members. And the concern was, uh, so you're concerned, we never discussed it in board four, but the concern is that fresh provides incentives for bigger Bonus. buildings. Okay. And uh, there was a feeling that that was not necessarily appropriate in these districts. There is a tax program um, where if a supermarket wishes to expand or modernize or even move, uh, they could receive tax benefits from the city that could be very, very helpful to operation of a store as part of a, like a 25 year commitment to operate a store in these areas. Um, and there have been discussions with some operators between the city and um, uh, the operator. Uh, so the, there is pursuant to what Jeffrey said, there is no no mechanism in place if the developer builds it with bonuses and everything based toward the market and the market does not come to fruition for whatever reason, there is no community give back or benefit that is still required to enforce either a market or an alternative give back. Like it's just, well, what happens? What so, happens? The buildings built, they've gotten everything that they want, and they say, "Gee, you know what? We couldn't find a market that comes in." So um, the building is now. This is again not applying in Manhattan, south of community districts nine to twelve, um, and the building is built, and the building is bigger than permitted by the zoning. Um, they need to come to city planning, the city planning commission, and ask for an authorization um, to relieve them of the obligation for the supermarket. And then as part of that um, authorization, there is this issue of, well, well, one, what did you do? And what are you offering in terms of the space? It has not happened as of yet. Although there are, uh, I will say, a couple of locations where people are struggling to find tenants. So, um, but it, 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 it's a discretionary action to um, um, be a non-complying building that they have to um, come into a process to make right. So uh, there is some, and, and that also goes to community board uh, as well. So um, there's a process basically. Yeah, so thank you for, I was going to ask the question, thank you for clarifying sort of the, the lack of growth in Manhattan. I'm, I'm community board seven, so you, you mentioned us a bit. Could you elaborate a bit? You sort of said there was some type of tax incentive or some type of program that was involved. Um, so um, the city has a, a program that's administered by the Economic mm -hmm. Development Corporation that provides um, tax incentive to supermarkets. And there are a couple of different mm -hmm. um, programs uh, one is um, that provides a um, property tax relief, which can be very, very, very substantial benefit 
what requires a significant investment in in the supermarket, mm -hmm. which you know, if you're building a new supermarket or you're totally redoing your store, um, it makes you know sense to pursue. Um, the uh, issue here is, is that uh, the city will only do this obviously in areas that are mm -hmm. stressed. It will not do it in um, places where um, you know it's a higher income area. Um, and, but there are areas in Board Seven that would qualify. Um, so, but there has to be like a new store or something. There also is a program that um, it doesn't provide as large a benefit, but is available where people are doing some level of improvement. You know, they're buying new freezers, they're redoing their cash registers, they have to do their uh, air conditioning or climate system, uh, which, you know, are very expensive and they generate sales tax. Um, and the city has the ability for supermarkets to relieve the um, payment of sales tax on that equipment, which I think is 8.8% or something like that. So, you know, if you're spending a few hundred thousand dollars to replace your an air conditioning equipment and you don't have to pay sales tax, you know, it's not an enormous amount of money, but it is real money in terms of what uh, the savings will be. Um, and um, We've worked with the council member there, both in Board 3 and in Board 7, to make sure that operators or stores are aware of these programs. And you know, what I've always said is the city has these programs, um, it has them now. You know, if you're thinking about it, you know, you should do it now and take advantage of the program before you know, the city changes its mind and the program is not no longer available. Right? Um, a lot of the stores, as you know, they have um, all sorts of very expensive equipment that um, can be very energy inefficient. And if you replace it, you save a bunch of money just in terms of your electric bill. Um, but also, you get something that's newer, looks better, uh, and is more reliable. So um, it's a pretty good program for the businesses if they're looking to upgrade their stores. Well, uh, I certainly acknowledge that. Uh... We don't want big buildings or there's a concern about big buildings but i would also say that we actually have had community testimony and, and particularly our board members particularly north of our district and i think this is an issue for community board seven and uh you know what the balance there or how to improve that but i'd like to have a conversation about that but i can tell you that i think there's a major concern regarding this issue particularly community board seven and need to coming up with a program that doesn't make big buildings would be something we love <laughs> but uh, um you know, I just wanted to make a comment that you actually have a lot of feedback from the community regarding uh, the challenges of this. No, and, and I think we agree that, particularly for supermarkets, um, there is a real concern about communities losing their supermarkets and having access. Well, particularly and, affordable supermarkets. Well, that's, 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 that's exactly right. It's, it's, I think it's affordable supermarkets is the answer. Yeah, that's, that's what we're losing. We're not losing the other. Mm -hmm. Is, is there any, I should know this, does Express have any statement on affordability or is it all? I don't know. I shouldn't. So, so I mean, we have to this, keep moving too bad. I shouldn't even ask the question. <laughs> okay. Um, so, just very, very quickly, um, uh, it, this has come up you know, can you regulate prices? Can you regulate quality? And um, yeah. the answer is the um, problem is, with a supermarket in particular is, you know, even a small supermarket sells seven to 10,000 items. Prices change every week. Yeah. It's very, very difficult um, for the city to regulate price. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can you regulate whether they accept EBT cards and the rest of that? They have to do EBT. Okay. Any other questions? Any other statements? Anyone from the public who wants to testify on this matter? None. We'll move on now to the citywide hotels text amendment. Okay, uh, my favorite. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, next slide. All right. So this is a proposal for a citywide text amendment to create a special permit for hotels across the city. Um, and the goal here is to create a consistent framework with how we regulate hotels. And just so um, you know, many of you know this, but just to be clear, a special permit is a discretionary action 
taken by the city planning commission it goes to the community board uh, and at the at its discretion the city council um, and essentially what's happening is people are applying to build the hotel and the city planning commission and the city council are reviewing that proposal the site plan and they can either approve it they can modify it or they can reject it um, next slide um, so uh, one of the things we want to say is that um, um, New York City has experienced record growth in tourism up until 2019. There were almost 67 million visitors, uh, up from 46 million visitors in 2009. Um, there was very sizable growth in hotel room supply from about 80,000 rooms um, to over 127,000, 128,000 in the past five years. Um, uh, and but despite the growth in inventory, it's almost 40 percent. Um, the rate of occupancy in New York City was about 87 percent, which is extraordinarily high and one of the highest in the country. Next slide. So um, um, the rapid growth of hotels across the city um, has raised a lot of concerns on the part of communities and the uh, planning commission. Uh, and as a result, a series of special permits have been adopted across the city to sort of better regulate hotels. Uh, in 2018, um, a special permit for hotels in one district was adopted by the city council, um, which is now in place. And the problem is, is we've done a number of these different special permits and they all have different criteria and it's been done more scattershot. And so what we're proposing now is to have one standard permit with one sort of um, issues that we're looking at, as opposed to having different permits in different areas um, that are sort of different, di different, and, and not always clear as to what the, the goal was. Next slide. Um, so it, um, it, what we want to do is have this consistent zoning framework, have one um, uh, special permit finding, and that finding is that the hotel use will not impair the future use development of surrounding areas. Next slide. Um, so in terms of where the special permit will apply, um, uh, it will apply in all the higher density commercial areas, in MX or mixed use areas, um, and in M1 um, cabin residential uh, districts. Um, and it will apply to all hotels built in the city, uh, regardless of zone district. Next slide. Um, now, as part of this, um, one of the things that's happened uh, as a result of the pandemic is uh, large numbers of hotels have been closed, uh, have been uh, inoperative. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that there's a reasonable supply of hotel rooms available in the city. And so what we, we're doing is, is we're changing some of the underlying vesting rules to make sure that hotels that exist existed in 2009 that have been closed are able to reopen. So um, uh, a couple of things are happening here. One, um, uh, hotels that have filed, new hotels that have filed and are sort of playing by the rules uh, after 2018, uh, and have gotten zoning approval from the Department of Buildings may continue without seeking a special permit. Um, hotels that have been closed, normally if a hotel is closed for more than two years, it loses the right if a special permit is in place to reopen. We're proposing to change that to six years so that hotels that have been closed can, uh, can reopen if they have that in a situation trying to figure out what to do or they're waiting for the market. They don't get stuck by the um, um, the uh, special permit. Um, also, we have a number of projects um, that are in public review. Um, Florida House being one in Community Board Four. Um, the Windermere is another one that I, our president testified on yesterday. That are all in process now, um, and so we are setting up a provision that if they were before the City Planning Commission. Uh, or have been part of, the, of a, a public review, uh, they can continue um, as a, um, without having to seek a special permit. Um, and all of this is like a six-year window, uh, where normally it's a two-year window. 
Next slide. This next one? Yeah. Excellent. Um, um, uh, just a couple of other things um, that um, what we do want to say too is, and this has become an issue, um, in terms of homeless, um, it used to hotel for homeless, um, homelessness. Um, this proposal is neutral on that. This is about restricting and regulating commercial hotels. It has nothing to do with city policy regarding homelessness. Um, and the second is, is that there is a concern long-term that there will be a potential shortage for of hotels uh, in 2035. And so we have flagged this is that there could be potentially a shortage of hotel rooms in the city in 2035. But this does allow the city the opportunity then if, for example, especially now coming out of the pandemic, this does actually make it extraordinarily viable for a, ho for a hotel owner and developer to say the market is not good. They could lease the hotel out to the city, as has been done in my neighborhood, for homeless for shelter services for a five-year period with no downside to the hotel operator or owner, because at the end of a five year, it could be turned back, correct? Whereas if it wasn't used for hotel purposes for two previously, so now um, it's up to six. So, so a hotel that exists today um, could be used for homeless services for public purpose, um, and they could do it, they are basically permanently grandfathered. They can always be a hotel. So they could go to, um, they could be transit occupancy and they could go back. The issue is a new hotel, a new would, hotel would be limited. But an existing hotel is, is permanently a hotel. They don't lose that right to be a hotel. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Any questions, any comments, Council Member Libby? Well, thank, thank you, Rose. Just a comment, really, and appreciated the presentation. We spoke on this yesterday at city planning. I just feel like hotels have a truly unique impact on neighborhoods in so many ways. They're 24 seven facilities. They often have catering halls, traffic and taxis, et cetera, rooftop bars, uh, loading docks, et cetera, et cetera. And they can be good neighbors. Some are, many are. They can be a source of good jobs. They can be uh, win-wins for neighborhoods. But again, not all are, not all meet that standard. And to me, the special permit proposal gives us a chance uh, as elected officials, as community boards, to help to shape these projects. Uh, it's not about killing all future hotel development. I certainly don't advocate for that. And I don't believe that would be the result of this proposal. It's just about giving us tools to shape it. Um, you know, we have Euler in this city. We have a steady stream of projects approved by Euler, uh, including hotels. So uh, I, to, to me, this is empowering the people in this room to ensure that new hotels are, are good neighbors. As for the timing, this does seem to me good timing for a change like this because um so much ho hotel capacity is currently unused and likely will be for a number of years hard to predict exactly um and we are coming as you mentioned i think in your presentation coming off a uh a really uh unprecedented um development boom in hotel rooms as you mentioned doubling the number of rooms in the last uh decade and a half and um, I think you said 25,000 in the pipeline that would not be impacted by this. So this seems like a good time to step back and figure out the plan going forward. Uh, it's, it's... Okay, great. Well, I am too. Put, put me down in favor. No, we got time for Go ahead. Okay, any other comments, so now we're going to open it up to public testimony. We have Thomas O'Flanagan. Um, you can please stand up to oh, come up and talk if you like. Can we sit down? Yes, thank you, Mary. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to read my statement. Okay. Sure. Who you are? Sure, my name is Thomas. 
Um, I've lived in New York City for over 12 years. I currently live in East Harlem. I'm here to speak in support of the proposed zoning text amendment to require a special permit for hotels. I'm not against hotel development. I know that hotels are a key part of any city and provide good jobs for residents. I support this proposal because it will give the community more input about development in our neighborhood and ensure that developers understand the needs of residents before they get approval to build. The public review process will be good for everyone involved, long-term residents, hotel employees, neighboring businesses, and even hotels themselves. This process will help prevent the kind of cheaply built and quickly constructed hotels that have been built across the city in the past 10 years that don't always fit in with their surroundings. Many of these hotels have caused problems in the neighborhoods where they were built and would have benefited from more thoughtful planning. I believe this text amendment will help prevent similar issues in the future. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily Fernandez. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily. Um, I currently live in Yorkville. I grew up in New York City. Um, so I'm here to talk about special permits. A lot of people have said that requiring special permits for hotels will hurt tourism in New York City. I believe that this is wrong for a couple of reasons. Requiring special permits is not a ban on hotel development. It's simply a requirement that developers go through public review and work with the community on their projects. Plenty of developments, including hotels, already go through this process, and the result is higher quality. Um, the result is higher quality and more sustainable projects. In the past few years, developers have taken advantage of their ability to build hotels wherever they want. And a lot have quickly built cheap budget hotels all over the outer boroughs. These are not the highest quality hotels and almost certainly do not provide the best possible experience to visitors. Enacting special permits will also do nothing to affect all the hotels that have already been built. In 2019, a record year for tourism in New York City, we already had more hotel rooms than we needed, requiring public review may slow down new hotel development, but that's not going to hurt the hotels that are already built, which are struggling because of the pandemic. If anything, slowing hotel development will give existing hotels a much better shot at recovering from the pandemic over the next few years. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you very Any, much. Anyone else to give public testimony? Okay, seeing none. All right, so, um, so it's 10 a.m. We're going to start the vote. Uh, some council members are on their way, so we'll probably leave the, leave the vote open. Um, and uh, we'll start with um, Madison Avenue. Uh, community Board 5 is not here. Community Board 6. Can we, uh, we have some issues with the way it's written? Yes, please. So both CB5 and CB6 felt very strongly um, about this application to the point that we both disapproved it. So we'll just use this one. So um I mean usually we we try to incorporate all the comments that are made by the community boards as conditional approvals in the borough board resolution. But the purpose of um, you know this meeting is really to make the amendment. So if all of the members who are entitled to vote on the application feel strongly that it should be in a, a conditional disapproval, we're we're happy to make that change. Yeah, could we? Okay. Yes. Um, just give me a second. I'm having some issues. Okay. Hold on, because I'm going to need a couple of minutes to. to sure. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to uh, the fresh program. Um, community boards nine through twelve uh, can vote on this. CB ten and twelve are not here. CB eleven. 
uh, and CB9 is not here. Uh, CB11? Yeah, we um, we discussed this at our last um, full board, um, and we will. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Chen on the FRESH program? Yeah, no, I know. Um, Council Member Levine? I vote aye. Borough President? I vote aye. Okay, we will leave uh, the roll call open on this on this vote. Um, moving on to the fitness uh, resolution, um, the health and fitness resolution. Um, Community Board One. Yes, but with the changes as we noted, which I think was that was going to do. So, if Conditional pending saying that the additions in community board one are inclusive. Community board two. Um, yes, um, an addition also with the conditions included. We talked about sound engineer and hours, restricted hours in mixed use buildings. Community board three. Uh, we haven't taken a vote yet. I got full board, so I have to abstain. Community board four um, cannot vote. A community board five is not. Which I object to not being able to vote, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> community board six. Yes. Community board seven. Yes. Community board eight. Yes, with the correction. It's so weird. We still have one committee. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? Our meeting on this is going to be in July. Correct. Uh, My so hand is yes. yeah. Community board um, 11. Yes. Council member Chin. Yes. Council member Levine. Yes. Were we joined by council member Power? No? Okay. Um, Manhattan Borough President Gail Berwick. Yes. Okay. We will leave this vote open until the other council members show up. Um, hotels. Um, resolution on hotels. Community Board One. Yes. Community Board Two. No. Community Board Three. Yes. With conditions. Community board six? No. Community board seven? No. Community board eight? So, a correction, we voted uh, to disapprove this on June 9th. So, I have to vote to connect with what the chair asked. The date of that is June 9th? Correct. Thank you. Community board 11? Uh, we voted yes, but we did not adopt the resolution we just recommended. And we'll be meeting for some in another direction. Council Member Chen? I vote yes. Council Member Levine? Yes. Manhattan Borough President Gilbert? Yes. Okay. We will leave this vote open and so could the other council members. Uh, Council Member Chen, we voted on Madison Avenue. You walked in after that. Oh, on that one? I, yeah, I vote yes. Council Member Levine? Yes. Borough President Gail Brewer? Yes, but I want my art. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we are waiting for council member Powers and Rosenthal who said they'd be here shortly. So all four votes will remain open. And meanwhile, um, Lizette will continue to make the changes to the resolution. Okay, we will go to chair reports. It is July, so community board seven. Very excited to go first. I will be brief. Uh, 
three things I just wanted to uh, touch base on. One is the obvious concerns that all of us on the community boards have uh, regarding having to do in-person meetings. It's particularly difficult for community board seven because our, 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 our full board was literally the first Tuesday of the month. So we had a very challenging turnaround. We ended up having a meeting and voting. Uh, we, we actually meet in July traditionally. So we had a full board meeting and we voted to suspend those, all of our meetings, our full board, uh, our, our traditional full board, I should say, or we left that meeting open, but we did not pick any business in our committee meetings. And I am continuing to express concern uh, regarding this. Thanks, Kyle, for putting together most of us signed, but we are already having problems getting spaces for September. So our four places that we traditionally use have reached down, have turned us down. Again, we're going to have another problem because ours is going to be the we the first Wednesday because there's a holiday. So you know, I, I, I'm just I'm just pointing out that this continues to be a problem, and I'm not sure what we'll do if we can't find a space. We'll we'll move to Plan B, but uh, we have problems in terms of and some challenges, and I think all of us do, but. Uh, since I went first, I highlighted them. Two things that I'll bring up, uh, our HHS committee continues to do really great work. We had an anti-racism workshop. I thought it was really lovely. Uh, we wanna thank several of the community boards that came um, and, and participated. So it was a great, uh, I thought it was a great uh, event and committee meeting and we'll continue to do so. And the third thing that I will bring up is our transportation committee uh, passed a resolution regarding uh, uh, e-bikes uh, last month, and that will be now held in September. Um, I think the main thing we, I wanted to point out that is that it's starting a conversation about these challenges. And I think that and we often hear, we, we particularly had two incidences in our area that were related in deaths. Um, and we at CB7, I think has had more bike lanes put in than most community boards. I, I, someone's gave me that stat, I don't know if it's correct, but I also think that we wanted to start a conversation that our streets are getting very crowded. And sometimes when you have progress, it's three steps forwards, one steps back, and then let's move forward. And we're asking both the mayor and the, and, and the city to relook at what's going on in our streets because we've got a lot of bikes, we've got a lot of e-bikes, we've got a lot of pedestrians, we've got a lot of cars. And right now, I think the feeling is, is that, that we need to do something to perhaps take a step back and make them safer. And that's the purpose of this. And regardless of where it's voted, and I think it'll be supported. I think the goal was let's start a conversation. And I think that conversation started. And I'd like to encourage all community boards and our elected officials to start those conversations. But I think right now our streets are fairly dangerous. Community Board 7 has a lot of these bike lanes. We've had multiple incidences. Since that, there's been two more deaths in our, in our area. And you know, again, we're progressing forward, but I think it's a time to stay, take a step back and reflect and say, what do we need to do to make these streets safer? We've got a lot of different types of people walking around and riding around and driving around. And I hope that we can take a step back and do something. Thank you. Um, just, did you include the scooters in that resolution? This particular one was about e-bikes and e-scooters and limiting them, looking at them and then limiting their driving. And, just as a reflection, they're driving 25 miles an hour and they are very fast and there's very little to no regulations. People should also know there's no insurance. So if right. you get hit by one of those, there is no insurance. Right. And that is very, very dangerous. Right. And if somebody gets run over and you have a death, which happened for us, that's a, I mean, people don't realize there is no insurance. There has to be some <laughs> regulation or something. And I understand it's a very complicated issue that I'll just leave at that if people understand but something needs to be done. We cannot continue to go on and have this danger. And if we're going to continue to make our city green, we also have to make it safe. Thank you. Thanks. Board eight. So um, I just want to join in, in saluting Pat and Community Board Six and coordinating a letter from all of us. It's great to work with everybody. It has been a challenge to uh, try to adjust to the sudden reintroduction of in-person meetings. And, and We actually haven't had a full board meeting yet this month. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we have to do next week, but that actually works out well because the real the main issue that I wanted to talk about is the uh, center project that's going on in the district. Um, you know, for uh, many of you hosted earlier this week, and, uh, and it was uh, very 
very successful, and a lot of people from the community came out to express their opposition to this project. And it's something that I mentioned last month at the Borough the meeting. But uh, you know, this is something that we're very concerned about that affects our district, but we think it has implications that go beyond our district and really implicates um, and happen more broadly because it affects our AP zoning in the mid block, which is something that communities all over Manhattan cherish and value very, very highly. And our concern is that if this RAP zoning goes through, it's going to set a very dangerous precedent for other areas that have RAP zoning. And again, RAP zoning is very popular, preserves lower density in mid block areas, which I know is very important, certainly for us and I think for other communities. So we really are asking for other uh, boards to join us in opposing this. Of course, all the council members will oppose it also. And um, you know, I got some interest from uh, some community boards and board chairs when I mentioned this at the last meeting. But uh, if there are other folks who would like to get more information about this, um, we are are happy to provide it because again, it's uh, principles that I think are broadly applicable related to RAP zoning and also just generally community input on facilities in our districts and uh, you know, we that impact on park. Uh, that's going to be severely impacted by this. The school is going to be severely impacted by this. That has students from all over the city, including other parts of Manhattan. So please do uh, let me know if this is something that you're interested in learning more about. Okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, Council Member Howard, are you ready to vote? I am ready to vote. If I vote, I might want me to vote for it. Um, yes. Uh, Madison Avenue. Okay, I'm going to vote aye. And the other three, I forgot. Okay, on um, Madison Avenue, yes, on Madison Avenue, <coughs> just so um, folks can see it here. Um, Kyle, it's a, it's been changed to a disapproval of the following conditions. Uh, can you really read the conditions for that? Sure. Uh, the first one is that the proposed building needs a daylight, daylight in street wall and setback requirements of the current building. Uh, number two, that the applicant enhance the proposed transit improvements on site and off site to justify the requested additional floor area. Number three, that the applicant reduce the width of the proposed lobby to accommodate retail parking requirements along Madison Avenue in the Vanderbilt Carter sub area. Number four, that the proposed building meet or exceed the 2020 New York City Energy Code. Number five, that the proposed loaning facilities on East 45th Street be relocated to maintain consistent retail frontage. And number six, that any rent generated on the site be committed to local transit infrastructure. Councilman, this came from the community board. Um, I will vote aye on that, and I will vote uh, aye on that. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. We will leave the vote open for Councilmember Rosenthal, who's still on the record. Um, do, do you want to go through any of the other changes on the other resolutions? Sure, at point, I can highlight them. Uh, I've added, um, Tammy, your comment on the application for um, fresh um, regarding uh, strengthening the definition of supermarkets to make sure that we don't have high end um, food halls included. Um, as part of the bonus. Um, I don't have any notes on uh, any changes to the resolution for hotels. Does anyone else has? There was um, a condition by CB3. Yeah, CB3 okay. Yes, I, I believe I uh, voted to recommend disapproval. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yes, that's been updated. Um, uh, Alicia, yes. you had um, some conditions on hotel. Oh, yes. Yes, the condition was about the short term rentals um, proposed for like the future of what uh, the demand is going to look like. So uh, it, it's right now it's not impactful, but we are projecting what the impact will be in the future. Um, the higher the demand or the lower the demand, uh, and that these uh, hotels, if they don't get enough uh, patronage, what will happen, they will transfer the units into Airbnb units. 
leaving, you know, the city is already going through issues with apartment rentals and housing situations. So this is like a, a future um, reference. Yeah, the, the CB3 comments are reflected yes, in the whereas, yes, and then you. just to make sure the condition as it's written in the borough board resolution is that uh, <coughs> the enforcement related to illegal short term uh, hotels be strengthened. Yes, that's correct. Great, thank you. Um, and on fitness, you. So yes, on fitness, I'm sorry, Stephen. Can you just um, uh, repeat for me? I know you all voted to to recommend is it approval <coughs> with conditions. Stephen, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, on the um, health and fitness tax amendment, I uh, just wanted to confirm Community Board 7 voted to. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. We, we approved that at the land. We approved this at land use, but okay. have not approved that at the full board. Okay. Apologies. Okay, so I will note that um, Community Board 7. Was that approval, no conditions? Approval, no conditions. Okay. Thank you. And you want the rule of changes, right? Okay. Um, Council um, member Helen Rosenthal is here. Um, <laughs> are you ready to vote on four resolutions? I am. Okay. Madison Avenue? I vote aye. Fresh program? Mm, I vote aye. Health and fitness? I vote aye. Hotels? I vote aye. Um, community board six on Madison Avenue? Aye. Great. Um, so, just did the final. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, community board 11. Oh, hi. Okay. Um, so first I just want to um, thank um, Madame Borough President for coming out to the CD11 full board this past um, Tuesday. Um, she gave a proclamation on behalf of um, her office for Joe Goldblum, who is an existing member um, over 40 years of service for um, the social services and government as well as to Queens and the um, CD11. So thank you for that, Gail. Um, let me see, I just took some quick notes. We're currently, we're going to be participating in the event at Wagner next week to support the mayor's action plan. We want to thank CD6 for their leadership in terms of um, reaching out to the community boards and noting our concerns, uh, our meetings being put in person at such a short period of time. So I want to thank uh, Kyle for that and all my other fellow um, chairs who have signed on. Um, I just did, we just did a ribbon cutting at 125th and Park and Gail was there. And so um, that's going to be really wonderful um, if we can maintain it as that is a problematic area for us. Um, Salsa Saturdays at La Marqueta started on 112th Street and Park. So if you're all available on a Saturday, come on down. And, and get your Hispanic dancing shoes on. Um, <laughs> an announcement for the redevelopment of the East Harlem Multi Service Center and the NYPD lot is imminent. And so we will be finding out within maybe a week or sooner than that who will be redeveloping <clears throat> affordable housing at Community Board 11. Um, we've had pre Euler presentations from the Fortune Society for. Um, subsidized housing and a an, uh, um, supportive housing project that they're doing for formerly incarcerated individuals in East Harlem. We've had a presentation regarding the PAC program for plank conversions in East Harlem. We just had La Raisa's residential development presentation. They're going to be doing 84 um, apartments and scattered sites. Second Avenue subway presentations. We have three open streets in East Harlem, on East 104th, East 106th, and East 118th. 
on August 18th, we're gonna have a budget town hall for um, informing the statement of district needs and we're circulating a flyer um, seeking public input where people can scan the code and input their information. We as well are concerned about bike lanes. Um, we had a present, we have one public member and we have other public members concerned about the proliferation of bike lanes and especially in cases of worship where a bike lane is put right directly in front or near and they can't park. And so there's a concern about accessibility. Um, so we just want to go on record with that. If you'd like to look at what can be um, done. And I believe that's it. I have a whole bunch of scribbled notes, but I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give the vote tallies. Uh, we achieved quorums of the seven voting members from Madison Avenue. Six were present, six voted in favor, zero against, and zero abstentions. The resolution passes on the fresh program of the eight voting members. Six were present, six voted in favor, zero against, with zero abstentions. The resolution passes. For the health and fitness resolution of the 12 voting members, uh, 10 voted in favor, zero abstentions, no, one abstention, and no one against. The resolution passes with the changes. With the with all, the, all changes. the changes, right? Because we didn't see all of them mm -hmm. on that one. Which ones are you referring to? Fitness. Fitness. Was no, like, I know which changes. Uh, about the uh, outdoor spaces, the COBs, and community input prior to, and then there was also enforcement questions that were raised. Okay, so let's just go through that to be certain. So. Number three um, is that the proposed zoning test require that all activities are conducted within the confines of the licensed space, um, which may or may not include unenclosed spaces. So um, would you like to modify that one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, just give me a direction here so I can. And also, the sound has to have a professional sound engineer, right? Yeah. Now also. Right. Okay. Was that? I have some of the language from the CB2 resolution on my phone. I can just send that to you. Um, Would that be easiest? Um, yeah. If, if if folks can just sort of dictate to me, that I think will be smoothest. Okay. So from the CB2 verification to the DOB is by a professional certification by acoustical engineer. So no, this is not the indoor outdoor issue, right? Well, no, this is not the indoor outdoor. Okay. Tammy's on, coming up for that. So this is, this is the sound. sound. Um, I can text. Okay, okay ready? Um, I can yes, also text. I'm just text trying it. to make sure that I'm making text it to the right. Can she text it to you? Then you have it and cut it. And uh, it. Sure. Let's see if I have it. Because I think the same thing, board one can text it too, right? Why don't we do that and keep going? I yes. can, because you I can. think mine needs to go after Janine's because right. they're as, long. Yeah. Yes, Janine, if you can just email that to me. Oh, I just, I'm going to, okay. I got it. I got it. And then I got it. Yeah. Then we can just incorporate the interest, right? Yes. You know what? I can email it and I'll just list the numbers. Keep going. Okay. Um, on the final resolution on hotels of the 12 voting members, 12 were present, eight voted yes, four voted against, and there were zero abstentions. So the resolution passes. Um, so we'll move on to um, Community Board One. Are you ready to give your report or? Uh, give me a sec so I can send the language to the yes. set. You can Why don't I move to Community Board Six? Um, so as has been mentioned, uh, we put together a letter uh, about the uh, quick return back to in-person meetings. So I just want to thank all of the community board chairs for collaboration. Uh, quite often, it's kind of like herding cats, but I think in this particular case, it all really came together in a quick amount of time, which I think demonstrates 
uh, a passion for this issue and the need for it within our uh, community. So continue to uh, thank everyone for their support and we continue to share it on your socials and otherwise. Um, I think, you know, in particular, uh, this was the idea of having the option to work remotely, um, not have it be anything other than that. Um, if things are working person for um, some boards, that's fine, but to give an option to those that are having issues with that, we had a very similar issue to CB7 where just could not get access to space um, to have in-person meetings, so we actually have to cancel some meetings. Uh, uh, um, so uh, we would really appreciate the VP's uh, support on that as well, and we sent you the letter as well, um, and we sent it to our local officials as well, so hopefully we get some traction on that. Um, and it also calls for discussions and actually amending the open meetings law. Uh, a lot has changed in the last 15 months about accessibility, uh, about what was actually more open to the public. Uh, and there hasn't really been a proper forum uh, for those voices to be heard. And so we really would like that to be updated. It's kind of like people sticking to typewriters when we have computers available. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that that's uh, adopted um, accordingly. Uh, aside from that, we're continuing to monitor the Mount Sinai Beth Israel sites. We appreciate the borough president's support in that, uh, as well as our local officials, particularly Council Member Rivera. Uh, and we're supporting our uh, temporary shelters and the communities that were within those temporary shelters and transitioning back um, to their permanent uh, shelters. So we're continuing to monitor that and support that. Um, also, want to give a shout out to our community for working on the Washington Irving High School. Uh, issues that they've had. Uh, this was really led by the community. Uh, they've gotten a lot more traction and updates on, on those issues that they were facing. Uh, but related to that in the SCA work, there is another project on 14th or between 14th and 15th on 2nd Avenue. Uh, construction on that hasn't begun yet, but we want to make sure that we're not facing some of those same issues of trash, uh, trash impeding in the public. Uh, but also want to make sure that that bike lane on 2nd Avenue is protected because that is a heavily used bike lane, so we want to make sure that any construction uh, is not competing with that, so we'll continue to monitor that as we bring it up. Thank you. Community Board 4. Hi, everybody. Uh, board 4 is um, working a lot with the state these days as the governor has taken a significant interest in our neighborhood. Um, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, Gail could attest to that as well. Um, and certainly, Lisette, um, for the past 10 weeks, we've been working um, on the Penn Station. Well, for the past over a year we've been working on the empire's proposed empire station complex and tonight we're hosting a town hall of which we have over 300 rsvps right now um i'll be moderating a public session as it relates to that where the empire state development corporation will be presenting their general project plan for the area and we'll also have representatives from the mta amtrak um and hopefully the other railroads as well it's an extremely complicated project because there's not one lead agency on it um, and we have spent a ton of time um, hashing through the details, figuring out how to make this a worthwhile project that actually transforms Penn Station into a, a transportation center worthy of the city of New York, and also doesn't overburden uh, the neighborhood with superfluous and unnecessary development, um, which is sort of what the state has proposed to do in the meantime. So we've spent a lot of time in the past um, several months expanding the Community Advisory Council and developing a working group um, to really hash out details and figure out how we can come up with a plan um, to make this happen. This town hall is the first sort of informal process and then the state is required to hold three other additional formal hearings for the project. Um, so this would be an ongoing um, process. Um, as well, working with Empire State Development Corporation, they're looking to extend the High Line, um, extend it uh, slightly east and to connect it with a development called Manhattan West, which is just west of the back of the new Moynihan train hall. Um, and we're in talks with uh, ESD on that and they're sort of visioning around that. A key thing for Community Board 4 is making sure that while this is a great pedestrian improvement and we love parks, um, the streetscape around this area on 30th Street is a disaster. Um, that community was decimated um, in the development of the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, it's extremely dangerous for pedestrians. So any improvements we see to the High Line, we also want major improvements to the streetscape as well. Um, and then another big thing we can do to work on, took it up at, my committee, Waterfront Parks and Environment, um, is the Heliport um, off 30th Street, which is a tenant of Hudson River Park. Um, various lawsuits over the years. Gail's been working on this for a long time, but it's a major problem on the west side, and I know across Manhattan on the whole. 
figuring out how we can um, relocate, basically evict the heliport from the trust, Hudson River Park Trust um, tenancy uh, to bring some, some peace and quiet um, and safety to that part of the park. So that's where we're at right now. Thank you, Community Board 3. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here at my annual two meeting a year. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and happy summer. Uh, so a few things, I uh, just want to just thank Cal again, echo the, the fact that Cal took the initiative to help us and support us all and, and his letter. And I, and I thank everyone else that signed on to the letter as well. Um, I want to thank also my fellow chairmen that were able to, uh, chairpersons that were able to support CB3 in my ask uh, for some support around the SLA issues that we've been having. Um, for those that don't know, um, our SLA chairperson is a new appointed person who's been in position since January and she's been under the attack by the public. They, you know, it, it's just been a horror story for her and we were just looking for some support and I thank all of those that gave comment and were able to offer some support around um, the issue uh, and and we did we were able to utilize some of those and give her some extra tools in her toolbox. Um, so we had a lively text amendment meeting the other night, uh, to say the least. I, I think the public just really just was like, I mean, I, I think we're all frustrated, right? We, we don't, we have the uncertainty of what's going to happen, the unknown, right? And so um, it, it really, I think we got criticized for the, the most craziest thing that we didn't have enough space to accommodate the public or whatever. But I want to thank Brian Lewis in particular, because there was a, a member of the public from a community organized group that literally went on the attack on an email after the meeting and basically was like, how can the community board not have enough space to accommodate the public and blah, 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 blah. But then Brian went back and, and he was able to write a letter, uh, uh, resend the email back to the person that sent the email to us and basically supported and explained what the situation was at hand. Because I think that the public really doesn't know that we were kind of like thrown back into these live meetings and they expected us to have all this space available, but guess what? We don't have a lot of space because a lot of spaces don't want us without the mask or without vaccination proof. So how, how crazy is that? We're not even allowed to ask people if they're vaccinated and to wear a mask. And then spaces are saying, no, you can't come in without having proof of blah, 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 whatever. So you all know, because I know many of you are going through the same situation. Okay, um, today I we, we have another crazy issue going on and I don't know if any other community boards are going through the same situation that we are, but it's uh, it, in particular areas of our community that after the bars and clubs have shut down now at four o'clock in the morning, now we have the continuation of the bar and club uh, with the radios being blasted on top of cars. So I have a joint meeting this afternoon um, <laughs> dealing with the serious quality of life issues in particular in our area. So this is like, I don't even understand. A couple of hundred people hanging around in one particular area, just blasting music, thinking people don't have jobs, but whatever. And, and so we're gonna try and deal with that. Um, and then lastly, uh, we went, we underwent the process of hiring a new assistant district manager, which we're super excited to welcome Calvin Brown as our new assistant district manager. And this may alleviate some of the stresses in the district office. So thank you all this morning for your time. Good to see you. Hi, um, good morning. Um, my husband just texted me. How much longer? Um, <laughs> Unknown. <laughs> um, anyways, um, I wanted to touch on a number of things. Our big open restaurant meeting is on Monday. And I think the biggest, in addition to finding spaces, there's a disconnect because community boards members need to be in person, but we hear from city agencies that they don't want to come in person. Right. Uh -huh. So we said to, yeah. we sent an email to yesterday basically saying we hope that we have someone from DOT at the open restaurants meeting because community board two has the highest number of open restaurant applications citywide borough-wide as well but obviously citywide and i don't know if somebody's coming or not but 
Yeah, they came to you guys, but they're, they didn't they come They did to not us. attend in person for us, and it was a major. Well, please, Planning Commission was here too. Yeah, that's we'll good. Let us know, and we will make sure. We want to make sure DOT is there. DOT. 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 The Ed Pinkar picked up the phone and called our district manager shortly after I sent that email, but it would be great if you could help well. with that as well. Um, Washington Square Park, um, mm -hmm. we have a big meeting next Wednesday on that is really to follow up with what's happening in the community. Um, the complaints I see on Twitter are that NYPD is standing around doing nothing, which means that there's they've probably had, now we've had a couple weeks of consistent enforcement of the rules. So I think they're achieving what they hope to achieve. The bigger problem is the human services one, which I know Gail is leading a task force on. Um, and I read yesterday the number of opiate deaths in the U.S. has, has hit an all-time mm -hmm. high. This is a bigger issue in, in terms of addressing drug use and homeless, and it's in the park, and when they move out of the park, they just move out and about. Um, so this is a bigger issue that it, it's not as easy to solve as turn off your, radio, turn off your um, sound system. Um, I want to talk about this um, rezoning that we're going through with SoHo and NoHo. I want to talk two things, and this and how it applies to other community boards. Um, CB2, the, under the 2019 Charter Amendment changes, um, the city is required to give 30 days notice, um, which is supposed to help the community boards with additional review. Sending an email saying this is going to be certified in 30 days doesn't allow a community board to do any review. So what happened with SoHo NoHo is 30 days after that, it was certified, and there was a final scope of work, which is... 1,600 pages, a DEIS, which is 800 pages with appendices. It totals more than 16,000 pages. My dining room table is covered with paper and sticky notes as I pour through that along with other committee members. Um, and if we don't push back now, this is just going to, the city's basically saying we comply. So Community Board 2 let it, sent a letter to DCP and to Gail Brewer, and I think we need to push back on this because if we are going to get an extra 30 days to do an analysis, we need information and just knowing it's coming, it's not so helpful. Um, and so I want to push back on that. So the Soho NoHo rezoning, there's five areas where I think it's relevant to other community boards. One, this would be the first up zoning of historic districts in the city. So that means if this goes through, all other historic districts are on the table and will be and applicants will be coming out of the woodwork to up zone things in historic districts throughout the city. Just to give you an idea that um, the, the proposed up zoning is ranges from 40% to 80% to 140%. So significant increase. And that directly ties to the second issue, which is displacement, particularly in Chinatown, because the Eastern side of Soho is essentially Chinatown. And we heard from many people in the community and the seeker technical manual specifically says that you do not need to look at displacement for rent stabilized buildings because they're protected. We all know that's not true. We know about harassment. And when you increase the amount of FAR by 140%, you increase the financial um, motivation to indirectly push these tenants out and demolish a building, which is definitely a loophole under state law. Um, and so even with anti-harassment provisions, in a rezoning, we are very concerned that any new MIH housing that would be built would be offset by loss of affordable housing. And there's also a lot of loopholes. And the main one is it's the economics are there to build office space versus housing. Um, one thing that's a little bit, there's a, in Soho and NoHo, there's a unique housing use, joint living working quarters for artists. And the city has said, I'm gonna quote Alexander Maritoff, who was on the advisory committee. Um, he said, this is the proposal essentially eliminates this use, letting it die a natural or buyout fuel death. So the city is proposing to charge, many cases, artists who've lived in the neighborhood for 40 or 50 years, $100 per square foot when they go to sell their apartment, which is essentially a tax and essentially is Tapping in, a lot of these people are real estate wealthy, cash poor. So they, at some point, want to, they're aging in place. And so this is anti-senior, but it's also impacting people who at the end of the time 
people may have to go to a nursing home. I've been through that with my family. And what do you use to pay for that? You use your home, you sell it. So then they're going to take $200,000 away from a 2,000 square foot apartment. And that will not go to pay for your grandmother's nursing home. Um, and that talk, there are also things that we need about Soho. It's unique mixed use neighborhood. It's not you have a third, a third, a third, ground floor retail office space for people who live there. And a lot of the changes, including getting rid of the 10,000 square foot cap and other changes are significantly impact quality of life in the neighborhood. We keep hearing zoning is a blunt tool, but everything else to address quality of life issues is voluntary. And people are concerned that they're gonna be living in, it, it, it'll be the museum of ice cream, you know, mixed use <laughs> kind of, environment. And finally, I want to talk about mitigation. There were four major areas identified that would have adverse impact. One was historic districts, so I've talked about traffic, noise and construction, and open space. I specifically want to look at open space. I've looked at all of the major rezonings that the de Blasio administration has done um, after MIH. Open space is often an issue because you have add a lot more people and you don't add any more open space. And one of the things I want to make sure that doesn't count is it's sort of this put a bench on it and it counts as open space. We cannot, I've seen words like public realm improvement. So I love what you've done in the meatpacking district, but a few planter boxes and a bench is not a park and is not, is not a sufficient mitigation for lack of open space. Soho, the NoHo neighborhood is defined by the city parks department as the only downtown Manhattan neighborhood underserved by open space. Um, and that's in the secret technical manual. So that is an important issue. And finally, it, the devil's always in the details. When you read an EIS, you need to look at the assumptions because that drives the analysis. Um, schools are not a major issue in this rezoning, but what sh showed up was the city made significant changes to the ratios that it uses for multipliers for new schools. And they did that in 2019. This is essentially the first major rezoning that would be using those. So in Manhattan, for every new resident in the past, you would multiply it by 0.12. So a thousand units, a thousand new units of housing would produce 120 elementary school students. And if you hit over a certain percentage change, then the developer would need to fund a new school. The new changes drop that significantly. Community boards one, two, and three is decimal zero of four. So you would need to build three times as much housing to end up with needing a school. I um, mentioned this to Gail, I reached out to some experts on this, Eric Greeley, who used to be a critical part of the Downtown Overcrowding Task Force, as well as Shino Tanakawa, and hopefully we can task get force. yeah to a task force. But this will have a significant impact on land use mm -hmm. and school seats in our, in our borough. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Community Board 1. Wow. Thank Following you. Janine is going to be tough today. However, <laughs> um, I'm going to say thank you to Kyle for the letter for and his leadership in, in working together with all of us. We are a wily group, um, but we all stand together on the open meeting. So thank you so much. A thank you hugely to Borough President Brewer and Council Member Chin and our state electeds who stood with Community Board One who could not have screamed loud enough about the governor's plan to take away green space, open space, and put in essential workers memorial in Battery Park City. Um, the fight is not over, we've won round one, but I do wanna say thank you very much for the ability that we will hopefully now have an open and transparent process with no more closed doors. And perhaps there will be a larger consideration to um, include the essential workers and uh, who are actually the greatest affected and listen to the communities who have the epicenters as to what would work particularly for them because as Mark Levine so aptly pointed out on a map of Manhattan in terms of the most affected, Community Board 1 is not that. We were not very affected. We're, we're one of the highest vaccinated areas. So it's a little um, strange in our neighborhood. So thank you very much. We literally had kids pitching tents in front of the bulldozer. So if you want to talk about activism, my thanks goes to the community who stood and screamed and yelled which is awesome. So unfortunately, that's like the best news that we have. <laughs> um, we are also struggling with bike lanes and open restaurants. I use this as an example of 
Um, DOT, we had approved several bike lanes being added to community board one to provide connections north and south. That was done pre-pandemic. They installed those recently, but did not give consideration to the fact that with the open restaurant program, we had open restaurants in the street pit. So now we have bike lanes that come get straight down into where the restaurants are. And then there's no, you know, people have to go out into traffic and come around. I use this as a note for the discussion that we had because we started our open restaurant conversation. There was, this was a program, bike lanes and open restaurants. The DOT itself ran both. And yet the consideration and communication that they had with the community and with their own process proved to be lacking at best. It does not provide any faith that we have in the open restaurant program. They did not come to the community board meeting and participated only um, online for presenting to community board one regarding open restaurants. There was many, many questions that have no answers to. And it's very difficult when you're half in the room and half online to have that dialogue of when can we get answers because cameras are going on, cameras are going off. You don't actually know whether they're taking the notes or not that you're actually saying versus for example, today we're here, Lisette is here, she's hearing us, she's taking notes, and we have that dialogue back and forth. None of that happened. So in the level of public interest, I do believe the city agency were in person, they need to show up. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Which then brings me to the welcome to Eulerp mania in CB1. So we had a presentation for 250 Water Street, EDC did not show. And yet EDC has made representations to the community over the air rights and the ownership. And they were nowhere to be seen. There were questions. There was mechanisms that were approved in May of 2019 that would have afforded, according to the applicant, Howard Hughes, $10,000 a month to the South Street Seaport Museum, which is what we're all trying to say. So by this date, if there was no COVID, they would have had a quarter of a million dollars of funding potentially sent to them. They've seen nothing. And even if you said, okay, well, COVID, maybe there were no permits, there's no open space, none of that stuff, that would have still been $100,000. They've seen nothing. So the city is asking us to have faith that the plan that they're going to put forward to try and get money to the museum through the sale of air rights and everything else will happen. And yet we're two years, more than two years past the last promise of money for the museum. And that has never happened for them. So all of this basis of the rezoning for 250 Water Street is based on two things that we have been told as a community. One, city getting funding to be able to help the museum and two, affordable housing. There are poor floors that the applicant was not willing to adjust. No poor door, no poor elevators, but poor floors. There is no guarantee as to how many units it will be. They haven't figured out the numbers and everything else yet. So it's somewhere, they said almost 70. The last environmental impact statements and DEIS said it was 67. And that was before the height of the building was lowered. So we don't have any of that information. And yet we're being told we must look for it, we must. To put that into further context, it is a brownfield cleanup site. And so we're, the timing on all of this is just insane. It was dropped the day before the end of school. So on the last day of the public school year, with the site that is directly across from Peck Slip School and the Blue School, the community was asked without being able to provide really time because the PTAs are not allowed to meet over the summer. I can't get them to get information and we have to opine and give information back, but we don't have the public availability to get to the people who need to say something. So it, I look for I whatever help go, we I can get. You, but you gotta sum it up. Yep, uh, whatever help we can get on 250 Water would be but highly, highly. We're aware of it. We wanna welcome our new members and we also wanna remind everybody if you are interested at all in what the sides of Lower Manhattan looks like from the Brooklyn Bridge all the way around the bottom to North Moore over by Hudson River Park Trust, we are going through resiliency measures now. And if you'd like to have any comments on what the landfill options will be into the East River, please, I'm happy to send you links. Please opine and reply to the survey. Last is DOT did a presentation this week. 
it was troubling. The survey that was out there is very, very black and white in terms of open streets and open restaurants and use. It basically asked things like, would you rather have a parked car on the sidewalk next to the sidewalk, or would you rather have a restaurant seating? There was no nuance. There was no, there was no ranked choice voting. There was nothing that made it possible to really have a clear vision for what envisioning New York City could turn into. It was very black and white. And I was seriously asked that that get redone to be able to apply for contextuality. I don't want to interrupt, but I want to second that. We got a, it was, there was an incredible amount of feedback that this was a, it seemed like it was steering people in the right direction. Yep. And there was incredible feedback and dissatisfaction. But I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was going to say something, but I'm going to answer your, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. And with that, I close my chair report. And again, Madam Borough President, thank you for showing up. The kids in the neighborhood appreciated it to the beyond. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be really quick because I have to go on. I appreciate everybody's time. In terms of the open meeting, we have been all over law department and the New York State Department of State. We're trying to get it. it may have to be legislative, but just so you know, we are very, very aware of this open meeting. We are so slow. And I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think on the we've been pushing the public wellness bar. They know from the next administration there are 25 city and state agencies that work in the city. That makes sense for your concern about why is nobody coordinating. I can go on and on about the calls that I get about that. Um, in terms of quality of life, these dirt bikes, mm -hmm. every single person. I'm going to say e-bike. To me, that's the bigger issue too. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all in the street. Yesterday, 110th Street, I think 40 of them came by. I have written, um, we have had a press conference. The cops have had a press conference. They have to get them at the uh, filling station. That's exactly what they got to do and confiscate those bikes. So it's a, it's a, people get, you know, aroused as I do about everything, but there are so many different aspects to it. But the dirt bikes are one of them, or the ADHD. Mm -hmm. And somebody has been hurt and somebody has been killed by a dirt bike. And yesterday in Washington Heights, there was a, a four person, Hitting uh, guns from a dirt bike. So it goes on. Um, the issue of a um, uh, couple things uh, bike delivery. Just so you know, there is a terrific effort now because those bike delivery people need to follow the rules of the road, yes, but they need insurance and they need support. So we're working with those who are leading them who happen to be friends to say, let's, what can we do together? Community and the delivery people. Just so you know, we'll be following up with you on that. We did uh, on the stores, this ancient discussion of vacant stores. It's so old, we feel like you've been uh, discussing it forever. But two things have happened. One, finally, is my understanding that the open data platform, which is what I created many years ago, now apparently has, and we're going to be working with Data NYC and you, the listing of the vacant stores that exist in the city of New York, coming from the owners, how many square feet last rent. Is it perfect? No. Is it real time? No. So we can have lots of discussions. But we will send you how to access that information. And of course, you know, there's a store rented, there's a store empty. So it's not real data, real time. It's frustrating to me. But just so you know, they have, meaning the city met the letter of the law. We have to follow up. Second, working with Councilmember Rosenthal, we're all working with the bill, may not be perfect, uh, on this issue of rent, lease, owner, person who was renting. It's a, I think it's a 40 year discussion, so it's not new. And we'll see whether you like it. We may have some hearings at the city council in, in September, my understanding. Um, just so you know, we're working on that. I don't know if it's gonna happen, but I think it's something that came out of the task force that we had in this room many years over the discussion of small business and where it could go. Um, we are working on cooling centers. No surprise to you, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was really hot. Cooling centers supposed to exist. We sent out interns to every single cooling center in the Bowman Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Guess what? No time, uh, no information, wrong hours, and I should go on. So to the credit of the press, they picked up on it. Then the OEM commissioner called. Why didn't you call me? Well, why didn't you fix the problem before it exists? That's on my end. Because, you know, some people, we know, we, you cannot be in an apartment, particularly as a senior, when it's really hot. You could die. I feel very strongly about it. So we are now entering a new hot season today, tomorrow, the next day, five days, my understanding according to the weather. So we hope that it's corrected. The library is open, the schools closed, 
library hours were wrong. We called them. You gotta have the information as a government entity correct. You yeah. cannot have right. information that's not correct on the website. That's what we're talking about. So we're working on that. Um, we are also uh, trying to scaffolding is an ongoing issue. So one uh, person called up. They've been having scaffolding as a rental building for 15 years, and they have seen absolutely no movement. So it's in Board Seven, as you know. So to the long story short, um, we are, you know, like everybody else, we're pushing this is not a new issue, um, but I think we have the attention of DOB. I don't know, we're trying. We have now buildings calling us from all over the borough saying we have the same problem and you have the same problem and you get the same issue. Let's see if it makes a difference. We're also working on the issue of polling sites. Again, we all voted. We work with interns. We send an intern to every single polling site on election day, primary day. These are the early sites, obviously. Are you accessible or not? And we work with Sydney, which is the Center for Independence of the Disabled, to see if they are accessible. Um, and then we're also going to all the summer rising sites. There are, I don't know, 400 in the borough of Manhattan, I think, something like that, or is it 135? I don't know, 135. We're gonna go to all of them. These are the summer. I hope these schools are doing the right thing. Those of us who are parents, or those of you who are parents know better than I, but we're working on that. Do they have enough? For my information, arts. I want to know arts and sports are actually happening at some of us. Um, and then we're also going to be pushing, you know, the we all have been going to the I know for three. I thank you so much. We've been coming to all the meetings three o'clock on Tuesday. And one of the big issues we've been discussing is what is the money that's coming to the city of New York and how are we going to keep track of it? So we learned the controller's office is supposed to keep track of it. We also know that even the pandemic EBT is going to bring $1.5 billion yes. to the city of New York, which is good, but making sure that people know that they should use it and participate in the economy when it happens. Um, our office has uh, some expense money and its uh, applications are due uh, August 20th. Make sure that people apply. That's for the expense, not the capital. Um, you should also know that the correctional offices have now also all listed on their websites what they gave money to. So they all had earmarked money for the first time in eons that I know of. And it'll be interesting to know. We're gonna put it up on our website, but I assume they have it on theirs. Where did they give money in your neighborhood? I don't think they called you for input. I don't know, but I didn't get any calls. So just so you know, that's my God. Um, and you know, feel free to join us every single Tuesday at three. The information in the past is up on the um, in, on the website, one that was particularly interesting was Elizabeth Holtzman and one of her colleagues at their law firm. Question, I have a meeting coming up. What am I supposed to do about those who are vaccinated and those who are not? And as an employment expert, you were there. She said very specifically, invite everybody. Those who are not vaccinated need to wear a mask and those who are vaccinated don't have to. That was her feeling at the workplace, but it's up to you. But she felt that might be a way to handle the those who say we will not get vaccinated and you still want them to show up. So just so you know, as an employment specialist, so you don't get sued, mm -hmm. that was her suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to mention um, that we are going to keep working on the precinct commanding offices selection. Somebody, some of you have already mm -hmm. done this. The long story short is PD says, you got an opening in your commanding officer. We're going to do the following. Chair decides of the community board with the vice chair chair of the folks who are community precinct, chair, vice chair, two people who are residents and two people who are business. And we pick the business and the residents. The other one is, and they pick who is going to be the new CEO. Three people suggested. You pick one and the CEO at the precinct, at the uh, police plaza does select the same person so far. So we've done the three two, the three three, and, uh, Housing Authority, PSA 4 and 5. Seems like it's going well. Washington Square Park, thank you for mentioning it. Jenny, the issue there is simple. I happen to have been very involved with the drug treatment program years ago. I know them all. So the issue is I take a look and I say, why in the world is Park not doing more to deal with those who have uh, substance abuse? So we had a meeting, it's very successful. Greenwich House is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Greenwich House and the other drug treatments I got. Um, I don't know, four or five of them involved. We're going to end up with, it all goes well, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. And we'll do the park and we'll do the surrounding area and you go with your peers. That's how you make difference. Don't me go. Don't Jeffrey go. Take the peer. Person who's been there, experienced it. 
can talk and get that person off the street. We have vans that take somebody who wants to leave. It's a really amazing program. And I love the city agencies, but why the hell do I have to do it? You should have been thinking about this a long time ago. So anyway, it's all happening. There's funding in place. You don't need to raise a penny. Partly, I'm sure, has to do with the federal money, but everybody seems to have grants to cover this. So it's, it's very exciting. And I want to thank everybody who's been involved. Yes, we've been going to all the New York State Empire State Development, and thank you for those who are doing it. We are working on a supporting company, uh, Lizette, but there are about 14 more Mueller pipeline projects that the amazing staff here is working on. And of course, those who are um, big are the get the most discussion. But and you heard about Soho Noho 250 water, but believe me, there are plenty more and they do not end. Um, in terms of upcoming events, we are working with the Interfaith Center of New York on two Muslim vaccination opportunities, one tomorrow night and a mosque at 130 West 113th Street and one the following July 23rd at 23 West 115th Street. I'm not gonna give up on trying to get people vaccinated, but it has to be in the community. And that's what we're gonna to continue to do. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, DOT did not come to our open street so, meeting last um, night. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisette just to summarize those um, conditions that were added to the resolution. So um, I've added um, to the second condition that the facility proceed review regarding noise, vibration, and other quality of life concerns, regardless of the facility's level of intensity. Um, that the proposed zoning type required that the hours of operations for facilities located in residential or mixed use buildings be reasonably limited. That the proposed zoning type required that certification on noise levels be done by an acoustical engineer. And that the DOB, that, sorry, that the DEP agree to improve its response and enforcement of facilities that have noise level issues. Okay, are there any questions? Any comments? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Anyone wants to stay longer? No. no. Anyone <laughs> abstaining? Okay, You're thank you. Right the ayes have it. See you next month. Thank you. So it is hot outside. Come on. Good